guys can have a seat. If you're a note taker and you'd like a main idea today, here it is. When all around us we see corruption and division in our world, Isaiah 33 provides a view of what God does when people and or nations repent and return to Jesus. Hope, healing, and redemption are attributes of Christ's kingdom beginning here on earth and completed in eternity. This world will never be perfect, as long as we're in it, for sure, right? But this world gets to be, like we talked about last week, a foretaste of what is to come. Jesus can reign and rule in our lives today in an imperfect world. But he also gives us a glimpse of what we can anticipate in the future, that when he returns, when the world is made new, when we are given new bodies, when everything is made new, he gives us a picture of what that will be too. And then he calls us to live faithfully, obedient lives to him, and that we will gain a bit of what it will be like, and we'll gain it in this life. A foretaste of the greatness of eternity we can have today. Not all of it. We still live in a broken and flawed world, but we get a glimpse of it. We get to see some of it. And so that's what Isaiah does. He paints this picture. If you're brand new to this, if you're jumping in, you're joining us online, we're glad you're here. Our live stream audience has been growing. We pray that you guys would check in as well. If you're just jumping into Isaiah with us, we're 33 chapters in. This is the center of the book. So where we've been is this. God has called a man named Isaiah who is a prophet. A prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God with God's authority. Not always future telling sometimes, but most of it was right there in that moment, in that day, it was for them. Just like this message is for us today. Yes, it has some, some future inklings that will tell us when it's all made right completely, but it's for us today. Isaiah's been speaking to two nations, pre predominantly one called Judah, the other one called Israel. They were at one time all Israel, and because of division and separation, they become two nations. In this, these are to be the people of God. These are the ones that God has been leading and guiding, but they have fallen away completely. They have become disobedient, not followers of God. They have just gone their own way. They've started to worship other gods. They've made treaty with other people. They've done all these things. And God has for generation after generation called them to return to him. We do draw some parallels to living in America today. We draw some loose ones. This is about Judah today and Israel. It's not about America, but there are some principles we can learn from. Our nation was started on some biblical principles, some Judeo-Christian foundations. We'll look at that. We'll see one that is really clear that we see in America today. But this isn't promises for America. This is promises for faithful people. So this is anyone who lives in Christ. And then if a group of people live in Christ, as big as a nation is obedient to Christ. There are some promises in here. But remember, this is not about anybody who's not in the room right now. This is about us. This isn't about all those bad people out there. This is about the bad people, us, in here. The people that fall short in here. And that's all of us. If you're joining us, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Let me just say this about all of us here that are. We don't think we have it together. We think Jesus has it together and that the Bible will teach us how to live, but we fall short all the time. And so let's be really clear about that. Isaiah 33 starts off, verse 1, says this. Ah, oh, you destroyer, who yourself have not been destroyed. You traitor, whom none has betrayed. When you have ceased to destroy, you will be destroyed. And when you have finished betraying, they will betray you. This is another passage that starts with either the word woe or ah. They're actually the same word in Hebrew. They mean this, a great trouble, sorrow, or distress is coming to you. So when we say ah, we don't hear that. When we hear woe, we hear a little bit more of that. But what is really going on here is Isaiah is speaking on behalf of God. And he says, listen, great sorrow, pain, and distress is headed your direction. And now in this verse, actually, God is speaking to, for just a short time, he's speaking to the nation Assyria. So there's a bit of history here. The most powerful nation on the planet, when this was written roughly 27, 2800 years ago, was a, was a nation called Assyria. And they're going around and they are wiping out other nations and building an empire. And God has generation after generation told Israel and Judah both that if they don't return to him, he will allow Assyria to come in and wipe them out. That he will allow a pagan nation that does not worship God, an enemy of God's people, he will allow them to come in and destroy Israel and Judah. 
And so as Isaiah focuses on Judah today, he's saying, listen, the Assyrians are at your door. But then he says, great sorrow and distress are headed towards the Assyrians. So the the story kind of shifts for week after week after week. We've heard God say, listen, punishment is coming your way, people of God. Your way, Israel. Your way, Judah. And this punishment has been coming in the form of foreign armies. They've been wiped out in so many battles, they're barely keeping it together. Jerusalem is about to be sacked at this point. A king rises up named Hezekiah, and he desires to return to God, but he has a ton of counsel around him. Imagine like a a president and a cabinet or Congress or something. Imagine like one guy wants to follow God, but everybody else is still leaning the other direction. So he's had these ongoing battles. So he's had moments of clarity where he's been faithful to God. He's also had moments where he has done the exact wrong thing. And at this moment, everything has failed. He went to Assyria to try and bribe them and try and become an ally. And they took his money, beat his people, and sent them back with a message, we're coming to destroy Jerusalem. At this point, Hezekiah and the nation of Judah have nothing left. They have tried to align with Egypt to no avail. They've tried to bribe Assyria, nothing works. They've tried to fight and they lose. They are backed into a corner and they have nowhere else to turn. So finally, they turn back to God. Verse two starts off like this, it says, "'O Lord, be gracious to us, we wait for you.'" So here's what happens. The nation and and under King Hezekiah, they return to God. They start to repent before God. They start to pray to God. Okay, God, we hear you. You're right. You've been calling us to return to you for generation after generation, hundreds of years. You've been calling us to lay down our false gods, to not have treaties with other people that don't worship you, to, to rely on you and not on our own human strength or our own human relationships, but to be faithful followers of yours. And they're just saying, God, we have not done it. We have epically failed. We have have denied you at every turn. We have not done what you said. But now we have no choice, God. You're our only hope. So is God our last resort? You have that slide? Thank you. Do we trust God before things get bad and listen when God corrects us? Or do we wait until we have tried everything else and allow pain to drive us to God? It's a question we can all ask, right? It's like this. A lot of people have come to a place. I've done this in my life. Come to a place where you have some health issues. You've known all along you should be in the gym more than you are. You've known all along your diet should not just be fast food, right? You come to this place. You know this already, but you come to this place. You have a heart attack. You have a lot of pain because you're carrying extra weight. Whatever it might be. And it forces you to change habits in your life, right? We've all been there for some reason, right? No, I'm the only one ever. Okay. (laughs) Drug addiction, right? I started out partying. I ended up in addiction. I ended up in a ton of crime. I ended up in and out of jail. I ended up in prison. Like eventually partying was gone. Drugs were still there, right? I come to faith when the pain in my life was so great that I didn't have anywhere else to turn. Did I have a place to turn all through before that? Of course I did, but I didn't. We often wait until the pain is so great that we've got nothing else to do except turn to God. As Christians, we often wait in a problem, wait in a situation so long that our only alternative is God. Rather than way back here, like at the first argument with your spouse, you're like, okay, let's pray. Let's seek God back here, right? Let's have God help us learn how to talk to each other, not pass one each other, not yell at one each other, not call each other names, not fight. We wait until we need counseling. And we're getting ready to get divorced or later. Third marriage later, you're like, everybody's crazy. Maybe it's you, right? (laughs) When do we turn to God? When do we admit we need help? When do we ask God, okay, how do I get from here to there? When do we listen when God is telling us, listen, you've been doing this wrong over and over again. This is not glorious. This is not good for you. This is not good for your life. This is not glorifying to me. Stop. Stop. Do we wait that long to listen? Let me start with verse two again. O Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm in every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble. At the tumultuous noise, people flee. When you lift yourself up, nations are scattered. And your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers. As locusts leap, it is leapt upon. 
Here's what they're doing. They're, they're crying out. They're praying this prayer of submission to God. God, you're the only one that can defeat Assyria. All the treaties in the world with nations around us, all the mustering ourselves for war will never work. God, you're the only, only one that can deliver us from Assyria. Your strong arm. When you shake, they run. Right? When you lift up your hand, they are destroyed. When you gather, it is gathered. So they're praying this prayer of submission to God. God, you're our only hope. We submit ourselves to you. Verse 5, it says, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. I mean, Zion is a city on a hill in Judah, right? And, and it's, it's a biblical place. But Zion is typically an anticipation of what it should like when God reigns. Okay, so it, it kind of gives us a glimpse of eternity, but kind of also a picture of what eternity can start to look like here on earth. So when you read Zion, don't just read it as another city, like we're going to see some different cities named here, different areas named. This has more of a connotation of where God is reigning is Zion, when you return to me and your festivals will be celebrated again in Zion. So the Lord is exalted, verse 5, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. So God begins to change things due to their repentance, right? So if, you, if you're falling off, you follow a history of this. Here's what's happened. Under David and Solomon, you had a nation, imperfect as it is, a nation that is following God, right? They have moments of highs and lows. Their leaders have moments of highs and lows, but they are a nation whose one God is God. And that is the dominant theme or faith in their nation. Yes, there are people that fail. Yes, there are people that don't adhere to it, just like anyway. You can't force anybody to believe or trust, right? So they have this, they are, they are led by God. Their leaders are led by God. Their religious leaders are led by God. But generation after generation from there, they begin to fall away from God. They begin to worship other gods. They begin to not worship God at all. They begin to worship themselves, their lives, their income, their wealth, their power, whatever it might be. And generation after generation, king after king, leader after leader, they fall apart. And God begins to send people, prophets to them. Men who will go on behalf of God and speak with God's authority, God's truth to them, calling them to return. Generation after generation after generation goes by, they don't return. I'm sure there are people here and there that hear the message and respond, but the vast majority of the nation does not. Sound familiar? A little bit? Sound like we could relate that a bit to today? The message is the same. Don't worship everybody else. Worship me only. The message is the same. Don't trust in this life. Trust in me. So Isaiah comes. He's one in a line of many who come and speak to them. But now the message of God is turned from, listen, return to me, to return to me or I will destroy you. In fact, it goes from turn to me or I will destroy you to, listen, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to use the Assyrian army to do it. Return. I'm bringing Assyria. Now it's just, I'm letting Assyria wipe you out right now. You still have a chance to return to me. And the, the message has changed through many people, through many messengers. The message has changed from one of grace and mercy and forgiveness to one of an opportunity for grace and mercy and forgiveness to one of pain that will force you to grace and mercy and forgiveness. The message has changed. Assyria has now beaten back most of Judah. And at the center, their most fortified city is next. And they've done everything wrong. They've done everything they could in their human terms with the exception of returning to God. Now they begin to return to God. And as they do, almost immediately, things begin to change. And what we see is that God is promising now to take control. So renewed faith. Isaiah uses words like justice Righteousness, stability, and wisdom as what people and nations can anticipate when Jesus is their, sa <coughs> excuse me, their Savior and their King. This is what the nation of Judah experiences as they renew their faith in God. So he uses words like righteousness, justice, stability, right? Things that we want. We want justice in our nation. We may disagree on what justice may mean, but we all want justice. We want a country that works right, correct? 
We want stability. We don't want to be engaged in these 18-year-long, 19-year-long wars. We don't want this. We want stability. We don't, we don't want the, the market to be all over the place. If you're in the market, we don't want that. We want stability. Everybody wants stability. Everybody wants peace. Everyone, but, but, it, but it wants wisdom in order to learn how to get to those places. And God is saying, those are byproducts of following me. Yes, you can stumble into those things sometimes, but it is a byproduct of following me. These are hallmarks of people who are obedient to God. Righteousness is a hallmark. Wisdom, stability, peace, justice. And so a people or a nation who allow God to lead, these are the things we can anticipate. These will also be the things that will reign eternally, perfectly, but we can begin to experience them today. Verse 7, behold, their heroes, now this is talking about Assyria, behold, their heroes cry in the streets. The envoys of peace weep bitterly. These envoys of peace are the people that Judah sent out to try and bribe Assyria to get them to not come in and destroy Jerusalem. And Assyria, like I said, took their money, beat them up, sent them home. And they're coming to destroy Jerusalem anyhow. That's the envoy of peace. They weep bitterly. This is live telling the story, if you will. This is in the midst of the problem. The highways lie waste. The traveler ceases. It's not safe to go out anywhere anymore because your nation is at war and your land. Covenants are broken. Cities are despised. There is no regard for man. This is God's destruction on Assyria starting because of their destruction of Judah. Now, walk with me through this for a minute. Why is Assyria destroying Judah? They want to. True. God is allowing it, right? So God is using Assyria to live out their own selfish desires. They want power, they want money, they want to take slaves, they want to, they want to wreck the land, they want to be the only power around. Their selfish desires. God is allowing it to happen and using them as a tool to strike Judah in order to discipline them and get them to return. So is it fair that God judges Assyria? Absolutely. Just because I sin against you and God decides he's going to use it for your growth does not mean I'm not guilty of sin, right? That's what's going on. This nation is already wrong. God is allowing it to make a point in his people, and the point is coming about. They're beginning to return. So take this on a really small and micro level. Stuff happens in life. Sometimes we sin. Sometimes people sin against us. God can use anything to get our attention. Sure, right? True? So if someone sins against you, but it gets your attention, and God uses that to draw you back to him, that's what God uses it for, but it's still their sin. So God is now going to judge and punish and wipe out Assyria. Verse 9. The land mourns and languishes. Lebanon is confounded and withers away. Sharon is like a desert and Bashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. This is an image as the, as the story turns now. So it goes from Assyria as attacking and winning to Judah repenting and praying and submitting themselves to God, to God lifting up his hand and chasing back Assyria. And now in this passage, Assyria has been defeated. And now the land is kind of empty. All the power and the prominence that once was is gone. Those who are in power, like Assyria, are no longer in power. One of the verses we'll read in a minute that we read in the opening, we'll talk about these nations with a foreign tongue. That's gone. That's what takes place here. But it also shows that the land is a bit wasted. Everything's kind of burned down. All the stuff is cleared, but it's really vacuous and empty. So it's kind of a blank slate. So here's your next, next slide. The people return to God repentant and humble. Then God restores order by defeating Assyria. Whatever plagues us in life, God can destroy. God provides new beginnings. Imagine this is a blank slate, like a, 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 you know, if, you're a, if you're an artist, you have a canvas that you can look at, and it's blank now. There was a bunch of mess on it, and God has cleared the mess, and you're like, okay, this is our starting point. And it's, it's devastating in a sense when you look at this, and so this is a lesson for us. If you're here, and you're following God, and you become disobedient, and you continue to be disobedient no matter what God does, says, or who talks to you, or what happens, and you find yourself back here, God can still intervene and fix it here. 
but he has to wipe out all the gains you had and start over. Make sense? It's a little simplistic, but that's what's going on here. The land is now empty. This is their land. At one time, this land used to be filled with crops and with, with animals and all these things with riches that were theirs because they were obedient to God. And this is not some prosperity vision. This is, this is what it looks like when God is blessing a nation. It looks like this, but when they aren't, and an army comes in and destroys it, and then God beats back the army, you're left with the devastation, but that devastation becomes the blank slate for a new beginning. This is the place they get to rebuild from. Imagine, Will, you have a beautiful house, and a fire burns it to the ground. You start over, blank slate. But you once had this, and in this case, because you were disobedient, you lost it, whether as a person or a nation, but it can be rebuilt. Here's the blank slate. Verse 10, God says this, now I will arise, says the Lord. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. You conceive chaff, you give birth to stubble. Your breath is a fire that will consume you. I guess they have bad breath. And the peoples will be as if burned to lime, the thorns cut down that are burned with fire. Here's what he's saying. Once you lay down all your other idols, all your other pursuits, once you lay all that down, I will rise up. But the opposite is true too. Until you lay all those other things down, God says, I will not rise up. As long as you want to continue worshiping this, continue living this way, I'm going to allow that. That's your decision. I'm calling you back. You have an opportunity. Don't confuse that with, I'm stuck in this situation. I've enslaved myself to this situation, but I'm repentant and don't want to be here. There's a difference between God walking you back through what is wrong and you choosing to stay in what is wrong. Fair? And God is just saying this, when you want to come to me, let me know. I'll get after it. But until then, I'm going to let you struggle in it. And you keep going, you keep going. The devastation is greater, but it's all, there's always a place where God can restart. Verse 13. Hear you who are far off what I have done, and you who are near acknowledge my might. Here's the first two things God says. Or let me rephrase that. Here's the first two things God calls a newly attempting to be obedient people that are following him. I want you to worship me. I want you to tell other people. Let them hear far off, right? Let them hear the story of how I am rescuing and healing and redeeming you and worship me rightly. Those are the two things. It's like this. Jesus, at the end of his life and death and resurrection, commissions his disciples, and he says this. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Right? You go be this. We'll look at this again in Acts, where we're called, go be my witnesses. But notice this. As we get ready for essentials tonight, let me say this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. It's not make evangelical converts, right? Don't make somebody who goes from saying, I'm not a Christian, to a Christian. Make disciples, students of Jesus, people that understand, right? Baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Those will be the things we focus on in essentials. Well, what did Jesus command us to do? What was the teaching of the church? Why should I be baptized? Is that a response and obedience? What is that? They had a system of teaching. There was, there was something that Jesus anticipated from them. Isaiah is saying the same thing. Worship me rightly. Worship me correctly. And then tell others about me. The vision never changed. It's just people were disobedient. The vision hasn't changed today. It's just whether or not we're willing to be obedient. So Isaiah says this. Go hear all those who are far off. Right? Verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with a consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Now remember what we said about Zion. Zion is an image of what it looks like on earth when people are obedient to God. It's a foretaste of what eternity will be right? Little glimpses, little tastes of what God will do. He says this, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with a consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? 
There's this image of God, and it's, it's repeated over and over again, of an all-consuming fire. Imagine there was one, one commentary said something about the, and I don't remember, again, not my area, but said something about how hot the sun is, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. And we can get as close to 26, am I close? All right, there's our, there's, <laughs> there's the smart ones. If they're not mocking me, then we're good, all right? So we're good. There's the science people, all right? You know, they'll email me later and tell me how dumb I am, but that's okay, that's okay, good. <laughs> Bible, me, science, them, it's okay, it's all right. We can't get that close, it'll consume us, right? I don't even know what 2,600 degrees, or yeah, 2,600 degrees looks like, feels like, but evidently, the best thing we've got can't get any closer. Well, I don't want anywhere near it. It was 98 degrees yesterday, and I'm grumpy. You know what I mean? My, our, our air conditioning failed at like four o'clock, it's not working. So upset, so first world problem, right? I decided to suck it up and jump in the pool. So, I mean, I, you know. So, um, here's the message. Sinful people can't be in the presence of God. God's holiness is consuming. Here's how Isaiah says it in Isaiah 6. When Isaiah gets a glimpse into heaven, it says, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, meaning God, actually Jesus, on the throne. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. Remember that woe? Great sorrow and distress is me. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Here's what Isaiah says, ultimately. I'm going to die because I'm in the presence of God. Because I'm even getting a glimpse, kind of a nearness to Jesus on the throne. I'm so close, all I can see is my own sin because the, the, whole, the light, holiness, presence, consuming fire of God, all I can see is how broken I am. And my reaction is, I'm going to die. We all have that attitude. It's very Western, very American, very us. But like, well, when I see God, I've got lots of questions. I'm going to say, you see God, you're going to have questions. But it's not going to be like that. It's not going to be birthed out of pride and hubris. And it's going to be like, ooh, way different than I expected. Every person that gets any gl glimpse into heaven or holiness or anyone who even sees an angel in the Bible, the first thing we see is don't be afraid. So I don't know what it's like. I'm not sure I really want to, but right, I know that this is an issue. And this is the question. How can sinful people in a, in a place where people are worshiping God, how can the sinful not be consumed by God. Listen to this, verse 15. Here's God's answer. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, who shakes off his hands, lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil, he will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. His bread will be given to him. His water will be sure. I'm gonna sum that all up. Perfect people can do that and have no problem. Perfect people can just stand right there before God. No sin, no problems. Here's the problem. None of us are perfect. He's saying only someone who is perfect. Who can enter into God's presence? And when I say perfect, hear this. Only someone who has never sinned can be in the presence of God. So that's none of us. But verse 17 says this. Your eyes will behold the king in his beauty. They will see a land that stretches afar. Isaiah is like the fifth gospel. Isaiah is a book that over and over and over again preaches Jesus. He does it almost 800 years before Jesus enters into human history, but he preaches Jesus just as clearly as Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. He is this one who has always, God has always got him fixed on a king to come, and it's not a human king. It is the Savior, or what he might say, the Messiah, the Christ. It is the one who is going to come and rescue humanity from all its sin and from all its sorrow. You see, the gospel is just that. It's, it is about a God who created us and loves us and designed us and has shown us how to live, who has revealed himself to us and, and given us what it looks like to be in relationship with him. But all of us, from the first human beings on down, all of us have sinned and all of us inherit sin. So we're born broken and then we get on in our lives and we add to the brokenness. All of us. The Bible says if you say you're without sin, you make God a liar. So I'm going to go with all of us and say, I can't even number my sins. 
The gospel is that Jesus entered into human history and lived a sinless life and died our sinner's death in our place. He took the punishment that I deserve and you deserve, and he does not. And in place of that, we call that the great exchange, that on the cross, we exchange all our filth and shame and sin and pain. We exchange that for Jesus' perfect righteousness, his holiness, his spirit, his presence in us. That on the cross, we make the great exchange, as Luther coined it, our junk for Christ's holiness. So that we now can come and we can enter into the presence of God, that we can come assuredly, confidently, that we can go and stand before God and ask those questions we have and do those things that we need to do, to pray and ask God for direction, to pray and repent and say, hey, here's my sins, God, here's what I need to do, here's here's what you've shown me, and I need help getting out of that, to go confidently before God. That is, we, we stand before God with confidence, not because of our own merit, but because of the merit of Christ given to us. Luther, Luther, I said, coined that phrase, the great exchange. He did so out of 2 Corinthians 5.21, where he says this, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. We get to stand before God and not be consumed by that all-consuming fire because Christ stands as a barrier. Because Christ's righteousness is given to us. We get to go there as if We're as good as Jesus. We don't have to be defined by our worst decisions and our worst failures. In fact, we get to be defined by Jesus' greatest successes. You're not defined by your sin and your failure. In Christ, you get to be defined by his victory and success. Passage goes on, verse 18, it says, Your heart will muse on the terror. Where is he who counted? Where is he who weighed the tribute? Where is he who counted the towers? You will see no more the insolent people, the people of an obscure speech, you know, from another land, like we said earlier, that you cannot comprehend, stammering in a tongue you cannot understand. He's saying, listen, where are all the powerful people? Where's the Assyrian king now? Where's the Assyrian army? Where's the Assyrian language? Is it me? I'm going to try this again. Will you mute it? One of you. All right, we'll try it again. Where are the people that held so much power, caused so much fear over you? Where are they now? They've been destroyed. That foreign army, gone. Verse 20. Behold, Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an untroubled habitation, the immovable tent, whose stakes will never be plucked up, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there the Lord in majesty will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams, where no galley can go with oars, or what galley with oars can go, nor majestic ship can pass. He gives us a picture of eternity where everything is right. He leans into this place where we can look forward and everything starts to become right. He gives us this, this image of what happens when people or nations begin to turn to God. And he gives us the beauty of what that will be. There's a promise to nations. In fact, we have a slide for this. All throughout scripture, God calls nations to repent and obey God. The promise for nations to be blessed by God, getting a foretaste is what what is to come eternally. However, nations are often too corrupted by power to obey God. There's a call, yes, for individuals, you and I, to be followers of Jesus. But there's also some complete commandments we just looked at in Jonah, where God calls the entire nation of Nineveh to repent. And from the king on down to the servant, they repent and fast. And they seek God, and God delivers them from the judgment that he was going to pour out on them. Like we have an opportunity, not just us, but we have an opportunity as a nation to be a nation that follows God. But what inhibits that is people and power and money. And that's the system we live in right now. People strive for that power more than they're striving for God. And as long as our search for power is our most prominent search, our strivings for power, God's going to stay in the background. We turn and want to obey God. God says, I'll rise up. I'll act. Verse 22. I want you to hear this. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. As I said earlier, our nation was founded on some Judeo-Christian principles. Right? Some say we're a Christian nation, some not. Clearly, we're founded on biblical principles. In fact, verse 22 was one of them. 
You know our separation of power, if you ever pass a civics class, we have a, an executive branch, that's the president, his cabinet, and the people that work for him. We have a legislative branch, that's the Senate, the Congress, right, the House, all of that that make laws. And then we have the judicial branch, that's the Supreme Court and all the courts underneath it. That's where they get it. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, and he will save us. The great thing about Jesus is he is that eternal king, can't be corrupted. He's that eternal lawgiver who is only right. He is that eternal judge that will, will judge right from wrong perfectly. But then there's that word, he will save us. He's also our savior. So one thing a nation can never be, a political party can never be, it can never be our savior. We go to vote in just a little while for a new president and new people and do all that. Those people can't save us. We can elect people. We can do our best. We can, we can engage in a process because we're given that ability. But only Jesus can save us. Lord Acton said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Only hope we have of no corruption is Christ alone. Those three branches of government plus a savior is an amazing passage to imagine what eternity will look like without the flaws of today. As we anticipate a country the laws are are right and moral and justice is perfect and people are not corruptible, we anticipate eternity. But if we obey Jesus today, we can begin to see some of those things in our lives. I want to give you three things to take away. It's just for the week as you take these away. So what do we do in response to this? How do we take this and say, okay, I get that if we, if we return personally, what God can do. I get that the longer we wait, the harder it might be. I get that the blank slate means we lose everywhere we've been. I get that if a nation turns around, God can bless a nation. I get that. What do we do? So we'll start with this. Seek God first. Jesus should be our first option, our guidance, our security, and where we turn to in all things. Where we turn in all things. Making our faith a last resort option means we will endure unnecessary pain and struggle before finding hope and redemption in Christ. Here's what I'm saying. If you're struggling somewhere today, seek God today. Don't seek every other solution you've got, and then when you run out of options, Go find God. Seek God first. There's a passage out of Matthew. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Seek God first. Everything else follows. Second thing, our confidence is in Jesus. God is called an all-consuming fire that burns up anything less than absolute holiness. Jesus went before us in sinless perfection so we can enter into the presence of God confidently, find the strength, guidance, and hope that we need. We are confident that when we stand before God, that when we seek God in prayer, when we open up the Bible, when we, we ask God to speak to us, we are confident that we go before God because of Christ and we will not be consumed because Jesus took our penalty on himself for us. Hebrews says this, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest, meaning Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. As we get into essentials, we ask the question about the gospel. We're going to ask the question, how do we know Jesus was sinless? This is a great passage. Yet without sin, it says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We should go stand before God, not in fear of God, or uh, fear of God. Not, he's not an angry father. That we stand in Christ before him with confidence because of what Christ did, not because of who we are. Finally, we become witnesses of Christ. Jesus calls us to tell others about the salvation, healing, and redemption found only in the gospel. Our response to the immeasurable gift of grace that we've been given is to share it with those around us so they can know Jesus too. Acts 1.8, as I referenced earlier, is this. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. You'll be my witnesses here in Cerritos and Los Al and La Mirada and Norwalk and, and to the end of the earth. But you're the plan. You're the messenger. Not me because I'm a pastor. Me because I'm a follower of Jesus. But us. We're the plan to bring the message of Christ to a lost world. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We begin and end with you. 
We never leave you. Jesus, you have secured everything, done everything we need. It is because of you we can come before God and our sins don't consume us. I know the first thing, Lord, when, I'm, when, I, when, I'm, when I sin, and I come before you, I'm ashamed. I don't want to pray. I don't want to be there. It's because I'm misunderstanding that you've already satisfied that, and I can come with confidence, humility, but confidence that you love me, you won't consume me for my decisions and my choices and my sins, that you love every one of us, and you desire to be in relationship with us. Jesus, help us to be your messengers those who have experienced your grace so deeply that what we desire for everyone else is for them to know the love and the grace and the mercy that you give away freely. We want them to know it. Help us to be those messengers. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.